What five music scores would I take into my nuclear bunker, if I had one? Today I thought I'd attempt to pick only five musical scores that I would put into my end of the world survival kit. Unlike the five music composition books video that I did last year, this selection is uh, not limited to what I own, mainly because my printed score collection is embarrassingly woeful. Nevertheless, I found it a tough but surprisingly enlightening list to create, only being able to choose five, and that five being scores I'd want to keep me entertained during the nuclear winter, I went beyond favourites and pieces I have studied. Instead, I chose pieces I felt I could also have fun with and learn a lot from at the same time. Number four, for instance, I think would be uh, fun to play around with in orchestration. The first pick then, or starting backwards, number five, is Dmitry Shostakovich's Piano Trio Number no. 2 in E minor. This is a choice that actually surprised me a little. It's a piece that I do find incredibly moving, however I think I could also learn a lot from it uh, as a composer too. Piano trios are a tough cookie to crack. Possibly the toughest cookie of the cookie pack. Shostakovich's Piano Trio No. 2 is texturally rich, which adds to its emotional poignancy. Moreover, these textures stretch from the delicacy of solo and chamber music, as you'd probably expect for a piece of chamber music through to the density and energy that is uh, orchestral music often presents. Something you don't expect from a piece of chamber music. The textural emotional breadth, therefore, could be why I think the composition could be great to have in a survival pack. Not only could you study it, I think you could build on that study by playing around with it in orchestration and arrangement. Not all pieces facilitate that. It could certainly cure the bunker boredom. Number four is Franz Schubert's Fantasy in F minor for uh, Piano Four Hands, or D940. I chose this piece because it is compositionally rich but condensed, and by condensed I don't mean in the length, but vertically. It's piano with four hands, meaning you get something of symphonic proportions in length, but on four staves. You get something symphonic, but easier to read. Nice. With this form of expansive legibility, there's certainly plenty to uncover in study. Moreover, like with the Shostakovich, but I guess more so in this instance, you could play around with the Schubert fantasy. You could take bits or the whole and get to know it through synthesising your own orchestrations of excerpts and eventually the whole piece. At least that's the impression I get from it. How I would orchestrate this piece, I don't know. You could also go two ways with it. One, you could try and orchestrate it in the style of Schubert, or you could obviously secondly try and orchestrate it in your own style. I think it'd be fun to try both, and I'm sure there'd be plenty of time to. Maybe I could do that in a video. Pick number three is Frederick Zhevsky's The People United Will Never Be Defeated. It is a composition in variation form, taking the melody of the song The People United Will Never Be Defeated as its theme. <laughs> Unlike variation form pieces, however, it is a tightly woven piece. It feels much more like a long form whole as opposed to a lots of shorter forms tethered together, um, and held together by a consistent theme, or as in the older variation forms, a bass line. I recall reading from somewhere, although unfortunately I cannot remember where I read this. 
that Rachmaninoff would gauge his audience's engagement levels when performing his own theme and variation compositions. If he felt the audience were getting bored, he'd skip some variations. Maybe that's why concert programmers just skip my compositions altogether. Variation forms can feel a little studious, more like composition exercises uh, made by the composer that can suffer from a lack of dramatic arc, perhaps a result of them being you know, longer forms made of many short form parts. Zhevsky's The People United Will Never Be Defeated does not suffer from this, in my humble opinion, where classical theme variations tend to enjoy highlighting the link to the theme. Uh, Zhevsky seems to toy with that concept itself. Rather, the composition momentarily diverts or converges on the theme. We might hear a clear fragment or a link between a whole variation to the theme, and then we might uh, be completely lost and consumed by a variation that is very different. The composition is something of an adventure, and it is one that I would like to look at in the future. Those first three pieces were the more study-rich pieces that I, I think I could learn a lot from while also you know, having more fun with, as I mentioned, playing around with them. The final two of my five musical score survival kit are more personal choices. There's still plenty to learn from them, though, so I'd still probably discuss them. However, they are in my more irrational picks. If any of this video really falls within the realms of rationality... Before going on to those, I'd just like to say, please like, subscribe and click the bell icon if you've enjoyed the video. More importantly, however, please also comment below. I'd love to hear your five musical score picks. I'd recommend thinking about uh, what you'd choose in the context of literally only being able to take five pieces with you. Um, what five pieces will you have stashed away in your survival kit? I think you'll be surprised with that constraint of your choices and they'll reveal a, a lot about yourself. So the second to last piece is Luciano Berrio's Rendering. I simply adore the concept of this piece, the idea of finishing off Schubert's unfinished symphony by smoothing over the gaps in the score like a builder does when rendering a building. Berio does this with Schubert's unfinished symphony by smoothing over the cracks and filling in the gaps where Schubert had not yet written anything. However, rather than attempting to fill it with uh, what Schubert may have written as other realisations do, such as Brian Newbold, he fills it with his own material that uses fragments of the symphony. It's beautifully postmodern. While I have looked at rendering on a larger scale many years ago, I've never got into the finer details. Getting into those details is something I'd like to do, as I think the language of the Berio sections is marvellous. It's not tonal, not dissonant, not functional, but not wholly dysfunctional either. I want it. There's also a lot to learn from Berio's realisation of the Schubert score fragments too. Some of the sketches are incredibly sparse, yet I think Berio fills them out for the orchestra sublimely. I consider rendering a pivotal discovery for me alongside a handful of other pieces I found about eight years ago while being a master's student. Many of Schnitker's polystylus works, for instance, had a, a profound effect on me. Max Richter's Vivaldi recompositions I discovered around that time. Um, Arvo Pets, Mozart Adagio, um, and particularly a piece uh, by Canadian contemporary art uh, composer Andre Ristique, uh, Variations, Psychogeographic, Satanhauser. All those pieces struck a chord with me. Punny. Quotation, merging and counterpointing the old and new, distinct from neoclassicism, the techniques I love and continue to explore in my own compositions today. Those pieces and rendering inspired that uh, exploration culminated in my composition uh, in memory a few years ago. Not really done anything as substantial since. My final pick is an irrational one, but it's probably the one I can explain the least to, ironically. 
However, it means quite a lot to me as a piece of music. And this piece is Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart's uh, Piano Concerto No. 20 in D minor. Piano Concerto Number no. 20 is one of the only pieces I can remember listening to uh, for the first time as a teenager. Falling upon it via the serendipity of radio listening, the way it moved me has stayed with me ever since. After hearing the concerto, I knew I wanted to create music like that. And that's not to say stylistically like Mozart or a concerto for that matter, rather I wanted to compose music that I thought could emotionally move people. Incidentally, I think studying Mozart is a valuable endeavour for anyone, so I would likely study the piece too. There's not really going to be much else to do in the bunker. Mozart, for me, epitomises mastery manifested in the simple. He writes music that you think you could write when you're listening to it until you try. And again, I don't mean that as pastiche, but in the way he it's clearly you know, gone through a cycle of gaining competency, doubtless by studying and practising more complex music, before dishing up elegant compositions that package that complexity in an accessible form. The same could be applied to many great creators within and beyond music. John Williams, for example, often speaks about how the melodies he comes up with, the bits the audience, or we, often find the simplest, or the most straightforward are the bits he agonises over the most, or the more difficult parts he has to write. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed my picks, and I hope you'll come back again. As I said before, like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you'd like to hear from me again. If not, then okay, I guess. See you again never. Also, please share your five picks in the comments below. Remember, they're your five uh, nuclear bunker picks, or picks for exile. Either way, you can't have more than five. As a Brucey bonus for anyone interested, I've created a PDF document with what my list would look like if I were allowed to take a further ten uh, pieces into the bunker. It doesn't require any email opt-ins or other subscriptions. I offer a couple or few sentences for why I have chosen each and links to recordings. It's a little more diverse, but it's still limited to musically notated scores.